I wonder, how did you get into this in the first place? Well, it, a few years into my medical practice, I started gaining weight. I started uh, developing pre-diabetes. I started getting severe inflammation in multiple parts of my body. <clears throat> and the way I was raised, I'm a, I'm a lead by example kind of guy. And so I thought, I can't, I'm not going to be that, that fat, sick, diabetic doctor who's walking into patients' exam rooms and saying, you need to lose some weight. I couldn't do that. That's just not my style. And so I started reading and looking kind of outside the box because after I had reviewed my medical school nutrition notes and tried that, I gained 10 more pounds. And so obviously that wasn't the, the correct way. And so I started looking, I read books, lots of books, um, read lots of research papers, and I happened upon the primal, ancestral, paleo. And I did that for a couple of years, had some success, <clears throat> but still wasn't where I wanted to be. And then uh, I started playing around with low carb, high healthy fat, and then I heard about keto, and I thought I'd give that a try. And had more luck with that and reverse my pre-diabetes completely, all my inflammatory markers went back to normal, and I felt great. And patients would accuse me of working out, and I, and I wasn't working out. And so that, that was pretty positive reinforcement. And so then I started using it with my most morbidly obese patients who were scheduled for gastric bypass. And I would say, okay, you got the, the surgery scheduled in a month. Why don't you try this for a month? I mean, what do you have to lose, right? And so they would come back in a month and they'd lost 30, 40 pounds and had called the surgeon and postponed their surgery. And that kept happening over and over and over. And then I started using it with uh, patients with a BMI of 35 and up, and then 30 and up. And then finally I just said, any adult really needs to be eating this diet because this is the proper human diet. What did it take to go from the personal experience you had to starting to use it with your patients. Is that a big leap or is it? It was a big leap and I didn't open the floodgates, so to speak. I, I, I used it only on my most metabolically sick patients and I would tell them this is, you know, experimental. There's no research that backs this up because I didn't know there was at the time. Hadn't found it yet. And so uh, I would say just give it a try. I mean, you know, you, it's not going to hurt you to do anything for one month. And uh, when they had the success they had, I thought, well, gosh, I, it worked for me, it worked for them, so I wonder who else it will work for. And then at that same time, I was still continuously reading and researching, coming upon, you know, literature with your name on it and with other people, uh, Volick and Finney and others, and I, and I thought, well, there actually is some research to back this up. And so I became bolder and bolder in my recommendations of the ketogenic way of eating for, for more and more patients as time went on. Fantastic. Um, I'm with Ken and Nisha Berry, and how did you get involved? With um, this? He wouldn't shut up about it, basically. Uh. And I'd heard him talk about it, talk about you and all these doctors who were preaching this way of eating and how it would actually heal the body. And I got mono for like the fourth time in my life, and I was really bad sick. And I thought, I wonder if keto will help that. And so I went hardcore keto, and I was over my mono in a week, which is almost unheard of. You're hmm. usually sick for like six weeks with mono, and I had it bad. Like you could see my lymph node was like, I had a tumor, I was very sick. And so I thought, hmm, there might be something to this. So then I went another week and another week, and before I knew it, I was keto. We were checking my markers, because I have Hashimoto's. Uh, they were dropping, my TBO markers dropped significantly. My TSH was in normal limits and my symptoms were completely gone. So it just kind of hit me like a bag of rocks that he was right. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, now, in your practice, do you use the keto diet exclusively or are you still in a general medical? Yeah, practice? I'm a, a family doctor and I, have, I take care of people from 24 hours old to I just lost my oldest patient, she was 107 and uh, she just went to heaven. And so anybody in between, I recommend a, a, an ancestrally appropriate, and that's the way I, I phrase it, because I think that's what it is. And when you start calling things by scientific names, that'll tend to freak people out. So I don't call it keto as much as I call it the proper human diet or the you know an ancestrally appropriate diet. And for some people, I think that's more paleo, more fruits, more berries. If you're 12 years old and, and thin as a rail, 
you can pretty much get by with eating more of those things, but you're still eating real food. And so then if the more metabolically sick people are, the more I'll tighten that up into a, a more very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. Great. Well, so I got into this because of my patients, two of them doing it, and I was curious. And then I opened an obesity practice where I just use a keto diet, basically. And so I don't do the preventive medicine stuff that I used to as a general internist. Right. right. Now I'm totally a, a specialist. Um, and uh, is there anyone who you wouldn't want to do it with? Or how do you broach it with someone who? No. I think this is good for everyone. I agree. And I have patients who just don't want to do it. And that's fine. I'm not like the opposite side of the coin where if you won't eat the, the American Diabetes Association diet, then I won't be your doctor. You know, there are <laughs> doctors that. like that. There are doctors like that. And I'm not like that. If you don't want to eat keto, that's fine. I'll see you in six months and we'll see how your markers are doing. But more and more, I have patients who are like, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. They come back six months or a year later, they're doing keto because their next door neighbor had some amazing health transformation by eating this this proper human diet. And so they're like, okay, tell me more about this. I'm, I'm interested. And I think word of mouth is obviously the most powerful way to spread a message. And nothing spreads by word of mouth better than keto because you can see your neighbor going to the mailbox and they're like a different person. Any idea what percent of your patients are following mm, this? Probably, I'd say 60%. Wow. Yeah, 60, 65%. And some of those are dirty keto, some of those are keto-ish, some of those are high-fat paleo, and I let them name it whatever they want to name it. I'm happy for them to call it whatever, as long as they're slowly but surely cutting the stupid carbohydrates out of their diet. I appreciated your talk today on keeping it simple. That is a common theme these days. People want to make it so complicated. Um, do you have a role in the <coughs> clinic as well at the Barry Clinic? Uh, some. I'm mostly there for moral support and to answer all his emails because he just gets swamped with keto questions majority of the time. But I take a lot of time uh, while I'm there to see the ones who are flying in to see him because I want to show my appreciation for them to yeah. coming to us because we're not <coughs> in Nashville. We're in the backwoods of Tennessee, so for someone to fly into Nashville and then drive away to the Berry Clinic because he's touched their life, like, oh, that's pretty awesome. So yeah. I like to go in and introduce myself and just say, you know, congratulations on changing your life, basically. Yeah. So you're influencing folks, uh, not only locally, but so you'll allow people to come for sure. yeah. consultation. Mm -hmm. and, and we've had people come from all over the country and even other countries to Camden, Tennessee, to talk to us about the keto diet. That's fantastic. Yeah. How did the um, social media presence begin? So as Nisha alluded to earlier, I, I would come home griping about this doctor said this, or this, this car cardiologist said this, or this gastroenterologist. And she said, you know, she's, she is all over the social media. And she said, why don't you just make a YouTube video and just talk about this? And I thought, that's dumb, I'm not gonna do that. And so one day, <clears throat> we were sitting at the movie theater, waiting for the movie. Uh, because the, the owner of that theater, he won't open the theater in advance, like you can sell stuff, and, but he won't do that. You, five minutes before the movie starts, he opens the doors. And so we're sitting there waiting. And she said, well, let's, we were talking about um, gluten and bread. Mm -hmm. and, she, and she said, well, let's just go live on Facebook and talk about it. We were already talking about it. And I was like, okay. So she set the, the phone on the dashboard and we went live in the parking lot of the movie theater and there were people popping up out of everywhere asking questions like, wait, what about this? Wait, what about this? <laughs> and so after that I was like, maybe she's right about the YouTube video thing. And so I started to make one a month or you know, two a month. And then we would start doing lives on, we talk about a subject and she'd say, well, we need to do a live about that. So we go live on Facebook. And the audiences just kept growing and growing because people were seemingly hungry for this. It's like, wait, this is medical and nutrition advice that actually makes sense that I can implement into my life immediately that's not going to cost me an arm and a leg. It's cheap, it's easy, and I can do it tomorrow. I want to I know more about this. And so it was, it's really kind of amazing how it grew. Well, it goes a little deeper than that. That's kind of how it happened but really it was I was really really sick I had Hashimoto's I was not myself I was a shadow of my former self like this is who I am I'm very 
get up and go, get things done kind of person I wasn't. I was just laying on the couch, didn't feel good, I was depressed, I had anxiety, we fought all the time. And so I started doing research too and I was like, no one's talking about how women feel this way and it's not just life, it's not just life that's making us feel this way. And I was like, you have done this research, you, you know, it's thyroid, food can maybe fix this. Um, you are a doctor, it is your duty to start talking about this, nobody's talking about this. You need to fix me, and you have the power to fix other women. Yep. So, yeah, yeah. are you going to cry? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So really, it, it started there because I knew that he had this fire in him that he brought, look, you're going to make me cry. Look, I'm the one on hormones. Stop. <laughs> he had a fire in him to help people, and there was a way, because we're living in, like, the coolest time ever. You literally have the world and access to thousands, millions of people really in the palm of your hand. Right. And we do it from a cell phone. He puts all of his YouTube videos from a cell phone. We don't have any special equipment, anything like that. And I think people really reacted to that rawness. <clears throat> it's real, it's yeah. unedited, and it's yeah. just who he is. And I've always had that fire to help people. That's why I went to med school. But you remember how the old practice was. It was kind of monotonous and kind of depressing. You weren't really helping people. You were just putting putting them on a new pill every time you saw them every six months. And so her words really resonated with me. I was like, yeah, I can actually do what I went to medical school to do. I can actually improve people's lives, not just improve Big Pharma's bottom line. And that was very attractive. I was like, yeah, that's that's exactly why, why I started this. And so in, at the Berry Clinic, I can see somewhere between 30 and 50 people a day on YouTube. I can talk to a thousand people a day or more and I was like whoa man she's right and and I, I was happy to admit that she was right and so I started really ramping it up at that point it's been about a, a year and a half now that we've been doing this and so yeah I'd like to in every day I get messages I get emails I get like you've changed my life you've helped me reverse this you've helped me put this in remission and that's kind of what I went to medical school for was to do that yeah. very thing. I, I usually respond by saying, but I thought that's what doctors were supposed to do. It right? is, right? It is what we're supposed to be doing, but so many of us are just dragging through the trenches because it, it sucks to be a doctor unless you practice this way. It's not a lot of fun. How did the book come about? And tell, tell me a little bit. <clears throat> so I guess two years ago, it's well, he's been, been wanting to write a book his yeah, entire life, basically. Yeah, yeah, I've read a million, and I thought, I need to write at least one. And so I thought, what can I write about? <clears throat> and, and and I kept telling her, we'd talk about things like, you know, doctors tell people if they have diverticulitis, they shouldn't eat seeds and nuts. And so that's not true, though. There's a huge study that shows that's absolutely ridiculous. But even the preeminent gastroenterologist in Nashville, I would send my patients with diverticulitis to them, and they would come back and say, oh, he said I should stop eating nuts and seeds. And so I got so sick and tired of that, I printed out this study that had about 32,000 people in it that showed definitively it was obesity, smoking, and processed foods. That's what causes flare-ups of diverticulitis. And so I would hand that to them and say, well, okay, do what Dr. So-and-so told you to do, but read this in the meantime. And so they would come back in a month or two with another diverticulitis flare. And they'd say, you know, I think I'm going to do what you said about that. I'm going to cut out the smoking and try to lose some weight and stop eating processed food, and then their diverticulitis stopped happening. They still had diverticulosis, but they didn't have the flare-ups, right? And so that, that's a, a, a family doctor should know that that's not true. But a gastroenterologist should absolutely know that that's not true. But here this guy was, who I had great respect for, was telling this medical lie to patients every single day. And they had went to the Metropolitan Medical Center right in Nashville and this guy I mean he's the guy he's the gastro guy in Tennessee was telling them this lie and I'm like how can I how am I ever going to change this and so <clears throat> lies my doctor told me is full of that sort of thing of uh, yeah doctors say this but actually that's not true at all here's the research and here's the common sense and this is why that's not true at all don't do that and so it went from one chapter, and I think the second edition that's available now is 25, 26 chapters, each chapter devoted to a medical lie. Hmm. Well, so um, how, the language is great, and, and you're teaching me that maybe you do have to call out how other doctors are not doing the best work, 
but I, I try to be a little more diplomatic. Than sure. What, what they do. <laughs> There's um, a place for that too. Well, mm -hmm. but it seems like this attracts uh, a certain following as well, or maybe people feel like they have been lied to. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, yeah uh, absolutely. Doctors are well paid. Not as well paid as people think, but we're well paid. We're supposed to be very intelligent. We are. In, we are. We are. We are. Our job is to help people be healthy, and to help people get better, and to help people have a long health span and a long lifespan. That's our one and only job, really. But it seems like most doctors are much more devoted to prescribing the latest big pharma pill that the drug rep was telling them about. So it's almost like their loyalties lie elsewhere. Their loyalties don't lie with their patients, which is where their that should be their absolute and only loyalty. But that's not where their loyalty is, and I think people can feel that in the interaction with their doctor when he just looks at the electronic medical record the entire time they're in the room and says, I don't know, I guess you're just stuck with this. I, you know, here's another pill I'll see you in six months. Nobody enjoys that. The doctor doesn't enjoy it. The patient sure doesn't enjoy it. Nobody gets better. The doctor gets paid, Big Pharma gets paid, and the patient still suffers. And so I think when somebody comes out of the wilderness, so to speak, and says, hey, that's all stupid. Stop doing all that and do this instead, they do it and then it works. Yeah, people are going to follow that message. Have you seen any um, fails, like people trying to do this and it's not working so well? Or So what, what are the top keto issues today of, of it playing out where it's not going so well? Usually it's when people come to us and say, you know, I've stalled and this isn't working for me, and we ask them, what are you eating? And it's always a very easy fix, like they're drinking four cups of heavy cream a day. I had a woman that was eating sugar-free Reese's cups and drinking a cup of heavy cream because she thought that that was okay. Obviously that's not. And she was having no success with keto, but she was doing it wrong. I think a lot of the mistakes come from not keeping it simple, overcomplicating it, or wanting to make things keto that aren't really keto. like the low carb tortillas and low carb things because people feel that they are, well, they're led to believe that low carb and keto are the same thing. And it's just not grains and ingredients start to come into play and affect people's health. And so for the most part, once we explain that to people and they stop taking uh, the labels for granted and actually really taking control of what they put in their body, they do see success. Absolutely. Yeah. And so many people, well, us as a species, we've forgotten how to eat. Over the last 50 or 60 years, there was a time, especially in the U.S., and I think it filtered to the rest of the world, where we wanted modern and new everything, right? You wanted the latest toaster. You wanted the latest car. Remember space food sticks? Yeah, yeah. Tang. Remember <laughs> Tang, right? Because it had been to the moon, therefore you should drink that every morning. When I was a kid, I would turn up my nose in orange juice. I wanted Tang because that was the modern, that was the, the sexy thing. And so I think we all just kind of fell in love with that modernism. Oh, you've got a problem? Let me add something to your equation to make it better. And when in reality, what we should have been doing all along is subtracting things from the equation. That would have fixed the problem decades ago. But our mindset is, oh, you need to buy a product, or you need a new pill, or you need a new injection. And that's, that's completely backwards as, as to how we should be taking care of all these things. A, a wolf in the wild, he knows exactly what to hunt for and exactly what to ignore. And he does that every day. And he, you never see an obese wolf in the wild, right? Maybe in the zoo when humans are in charge of feeding them, but never in the wild. And so that it kept occurring to me, we just need to eat uh, the proper human diet. But what is that? And so grains are a great way to feed the masses and keep the masses from starving to death. And so eating grains is much preferable to starving to death. I agree. But if you can do better than that, you need to do better than that. And so emperors love to feed their people grain because it's very cheap, it's very easy to grow, and you can feed everybody and nobody starves to death, everybody has a full belly and nobody's complaining. But what about their long-term health span and lifespan? That's gonna suffer. And so we're in a time now where everybody has access to all the research. You don't have to be a doctor or a researcher. You can go to pubandbed.gov, look up any research study, look at any topic, and find all the research done in the world, unless Big Pharma's hidden it, which has happened several times. Then you can, know, you can be an expert on that topic within a couple of hours. You may have to Google a few words, 
to find out what the big words mean that doctors love to use to make us sound smart. But once you know what those words mean, you can understand that study as well as anybody else can. And then you've got all the references at the end. You can look up more studies. And before long, you can be like Dave Feldman. You can know more about cholesterol than the average lipidologist, right? And so that's the power of modern times. That is actually the, the, the modern that we should all be clinging to, not, oh, I need to buy the latest type 2 diabetes injection. That's going to be better because it's newer, and there's a lot of advertisements on TV. That's what people are still falling prey to, and that's, that's my mission is to stamp that foolishness out and help people understand it's all about your food. It's all about the food. So it seems to me that um, the fundamental teaching of what good food is, uh, it's so important if we could do that at an early age, that'd be optimal, but how do you teach in, in your clinic? Um, what's the process of getting someone to know what to eat? We just tell them to throw out everything in their kitchen, basically, that has a label on it, because that's the simplest way to do it, and then build back up their kitchen. And the kids, we tell them, <laughs> kids are not in control here, they don't have a car, and they don't have a job, right. so they don't get to buy food. You're in control of that. They'll eat eventually. You just have to know your kid's health is important. It's worth the struggle to get them to eat properly. So we just go through, you know, throw out all the wheat, throw out the canola oil, the vegetable oil, all of that stuff, and then start work reintroducing real food into your family's meal. Buy a good cookbook and make alternatives of the foods that you were eating to make the transition easier. How do, but how do you define real food so anything that doesn't have a label on it yeah pretty much and so that doesn't mean that everything without a label is good right. because crack doesn't come with a label but it's also bad right and so you have to you and so what i'll do if i have a new patient i'll give them the step step one get rid of all sugars of any kind even locally grown organic honey even agave nectar all all sugar goes and they're like okay i got that step two get rid of all grains wheat rice oats corn quinoa, amaranth, all of it, get rid of all grains. Grains are what keep you from starving to death. They are not optimal food for a human. And then step three is to get rid of all vegetable oils of any kind. Get rid of the parquet, the margarine, the I can't believe it's not butter, the country crock, the canola, the, the safflower, the soybean, the peanut, all of that, and use real fats when you cook. And for many, many people, as you know, just those three steps will make a marked improvement in their health, how they feel, how they look, how their markers are. And then when they come back for a follow-up visit, we'll go to step four, five, and six, which is to start adding appropriate fats, good fats, eat some veg. The fruit may not be as good for you as you thought it was. Fruit's not the same today as it was 500 years ago. And so then we start getting rid of more and more of the silly, simple carbs get rid of all the processed carbs, and then you're left with good vegetables and good fatty meats, which is what human beings have lived on for the last 200,000 years. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming out to ADAPT Tennessee today with ADAPT Your Life, and I wish you all the luck. Hope to see you on the low-carb cruise again this year. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll be there. We'll be there. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks again. Thanks Thank a lot. You.